This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Neat Sahone, and it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition. Today we're going to take a look at cards from Weatherlight. I've recently done Top 10s on both Mirage and Visions, and now we're completing Mirage Block with a look at Weatherlight, which came out in 1997. To be eligible for this list, a card had to originally be printed in Weatherlight, and in all there were 161 cards eligible. In this video, we'll take a look at the 10 that have left the biggest impact on competitive magic. Before we get started, here's a quick reminder on how I score cards in these videos. A first tier top eight is worth two points. This includes events like Pro Tours, and a second tier top eight is worth one point. This includes events like Magic Fests. At number 10, it's Phyrexian Furnace. This is a one mana artifact that can be tapped to exile the bottom card of a player's graveyard. You can also pay one generic and sacrifice it to exile a card from a graveyard and then draw a card. Adding an immediate draw a card effect to cards, something we call a cantrip when it's attached to a weak effect, is something that made its debut at least as a consistently appearing effect in Weatherlight. Before this, these types of effects were slower, usually getting you the card on a later turn. Anyway, obviously enough, this is a graveyard hate piece, one that can replace itself in situations where you don't really need to hate on the graveyard. One interesting thing about it that was true in general during this era of magic is the fact that one of its abilities cares about the order of the graveyard as it can only exile the bottom card of a graveyard with its tap effect. Between 1997 and 2001, it was a nice sideboard card against graveyard decks in both standard and extended. It actually picked up its first points in 22 years earlier this year, appearing in the sideboard of a legacy Delver deck. However, it doesn't exactly seem poised to gain a ton of points going forward, as for most decks, there are better graveyard hate options available. At number 9, it is Firestorm. This instant costs 1 red mana, and as an additional cost to cast it, you discard X cards. Then, Firestorm does X damage to each of up to X targets. Having to give up a bunch of cards can be kind of rough, but this has the potential to absolutely decimate the board and even do big damage to your opponent. Most of the decks that have used it over the years usually have some special synergy that make it way better. For example, in Standard it was played in decks that used Recurring Nightmare, you could use Firestorm to get things in the graveyard you wanted to reanimate, and Nightmare even returns to your hand, so it could allow for a more potent Firestorm on a later turn. In Extended it was played in Necropotence decks which could use the powerful enchantment to draw so many cards that Firestorm could become a legitimate win condition. It also sees significant play in both Legacy and Vintage Dredge decks where it can be used to help you load the graveyard with multiple cards that you want there. It's likely to gain more points in the Eternal formats going forward. Side note, I always think it's funny to compare this with One With Nothing, a card lots of people irrationally love. Obviously they aren't the same color, but it's pretty funny just how much better Firestorm is than One With Nothing. You can still discard your whole hand at instant speed for one mana, and in this case you actually get an additional effect out of it. There are several other cards like that too, but I won't go super deep on it in a video about Weatherlight. So anyway, let's move on to number 8, which is... Disrupt. This instant costs 1 blue mana, and it can counter an instant or sorcery unless its controller pays 1 generic, and you get to draw a card. You won't always be able to counter something with this, between the fact that your opponent can ignore the counter entirely if they pay 1 generic, and it can only hit cards with 2 types, However, as long as you have a target, you get to draw a card, which isn't a bad fail case, especially because the upside here is a 1 mana 2 for 1, something that is devastating for your opponent. Disrupt has been played in both control decks and combo decks in multiple formats. In combo decks, its purpose is to counter things that try to disrupt your combo, and it's pretty effective at doing that. It's going to gain more points in the future. And number 7, it's Mind Stone. This is a 2 mana mana rock that can tap for 1 colorless mana, and once you're in the later part of the game and have no need for that mana, you can cash it in for a card, which is some pretty nice late game value, especially because in the early game it puts you ahead of your opponent in mana by a whole turn. Mind Stone has been printed in a standard legal set twice, first in Weatherlight of course, and the second time in the 10th edition core set. It actually only managed two points from the Weatherlight printing in Standard, but the second time it found considerably more success. There were decks in that format based around Makeshift Mannequin and Rebel Arc, and Mind Stone was pretty nice at making those cards come down earlier. Almost all of its points in Standard came in decks featuring one of those two cards. 
More recently, it's been featured in several modern decks, with the most points coming in Eldrazi Tron, and a few coming in Urza decks. It was also one of many artifacts to be featured in Krark Clan Ironworks decks, but that deck got banned out of modern earlier this year. Still, Mindstone is a very active card, as Urza decks and Eldrazi Tron aren't going anywhere in modern right now. It could improve its position on the list going forward. At number 6, it's Peacekeeper. This 1-1 one -one costs 2 generic and a white, and it makes it so creatures can't attack. To keep it around, you have to pay 1 generic and a white during your upkeep, or you sacrifice it. Still, while it's in play, Peacekeeper does a really good job at keeping the peace, shutting down any deck that's trying to win by attacking. It gained points in extended Oath of Druids decks, which could side it in against opponents against whom it was an automatic win. It's also gained some points in Vintage here and there, but it's gained the most points by far in Legacy, where it's almost exclusively played in Death and Taxes. This is a white aggro deck that generally looks to disrupt opposing strategies with efficient creatures that have hate effects. Peacekeeper may not sound like it makes a ton of sense, there, since the deck usually wants to attack, but it's a great sideboard card against one of the more prominent legacy decks, Elves. The deck usually has to attack to win, so putting a stop to that is very useful. Plus, the fact that you get to decide how long Peacekeeper stays around means that you can get rid of it and have a turn where you attack for lethal. Peacekeeper is going to keep gaining points in the future. At number 5, it's Gaia's Blessing. This sorcery costs 1 generic and a green, and it shuffles up to 3 cards from a graveyard into a library, and you draw a card. It also has a special effect when it is put into your graveyard from your library, in other words, when it gets milled. When that happens, you shuffle your whole graveyard into your library. Blessing has gained the majority of its points in Oath of Druids decks in both Extended and Legacy. This powerful enchantment is used to cheat big monsters into play in the extreme early game, or an unbeatable hate piece like Peacekeeper, as we saw a moment ago, but the downside is that Oath of Druids mills your entire library most of the time when you make it happen. Having Gaia's Blessing in your decks takes that downside away and just lets you keep on playing. It's going to keep seeing play in Oath of Druids decks in Vintage. And number four, it's Serenity. This enchantment costs one generic and a white. During your upkeep, it destroys all artifacts and enchantments. This is a very efficient way to disenchant the entire board, but obviously the fact you have to wait a turn for it to do its thing balances it significantly. Still, its efficiency and the powerful effect have led to it seeing a ton of play in the Eternal formats, which feature many powerful artifact and enchantment decks. Including the Oath of Druids deck I've already mentioned several times in this video, it's going to keep gaining points in the future. At number 3, it's Gemstone Mine. This land enters the battlefield with three mining counters on it. You can tap it and remove a mining counter to produce one mana of any color. When it runs out of counters, you sacrifice it. This provides some immediately accessible five color fixing, which is pretty great. Obviously, there's a bit of a downside in that it can only do that three times, and you don't have an option to just tap it for colorless either, but the fact that this can come down and produce mana of any color with no questions asked is nice, and as a result, it's seen its fair share of play over the years. From 1997 to 1998, it was used, as you might expect, in decks looking to play as many colors as possible, with recurring survival being its most frequent home. From 2006 to 2007, it was in standard again, and this time its main home was a Boros aggro deck, a deck that was interested in having consistent mana and not too worried about the later part of the game when the mine runs out of fuel, since ideally they'll have won the game before that matters. In Extended, it was used the most frequently in various combo decks, which were really only interested in using the mine once or twice. To facilitate their combos, it often included cards from three or more colors. In Modern and Legacy, it's most frequently been played in Dredge decks, but in the former, it used to also be featured in Bloom Titan combo decks, and it's currently being played there in other combo decks like Ad Nauseum. It's going to keep gaining points going forward. At number two, it's Doomsday. This sorcery costs three black mana, and it lets you give up half of your life to exile your whole library, apart from five cards, and you get to put those cards in whatever order you want. The other cards on this list all saw some play within a few years of being printed, but not Doomsday, which didn't start seeing play anywhere until 2010. For a long time, there just wasn't a great reason to use a card with this effect. I mean, what's the point in giving up most of your library and half of your life when you don't even get the cards right away? However, starting in 2010, it became a really important card in the Eternal formats where it's been a combo enabler because it lets you make sure you're going to draw your combo pieces over a sequence of turns. In Legacy, it's been used in Ad Nauseam, and in Legacy and Vintage, it's been used in Storm. It's gotten the biggest boost, though, from the printing of Thassa's Oracle, since that's a card that goes perfectly with Doomsday. Doomsday shrinks your library and makes sure you're going to get your Oracle, which will win you the game with its Enter the Battlefield trigger. It's going to keep gaining points in the Eternal formats, and it has some chance to be the number one card on the list in the future. For now, though, that card is... 
No Rod. This is the fourth card we could classify as a hate card to make the list, between it, Peacekeeper, Serenity, and Phyrexian Furnace. This one shuts down all artifact activated abilities. The first place it saw play was in Extended, where it could be used to shut down the incredibly busted Memory Jar decks in the format. Apart from that, its points have all come in the Eternal formats, which makes a lot of sense. Those two formats are the most dominated by artifacts of any of them, including many powerful ones with activated abilities. For example, right now, it's one of the best ways to shut down the One Ring, and in Vintage, it stops the Mana Rocks of the Power Nine. There will virtually always be busted artifacts in those formats, and as long as that continues to be true, we can count on Null Rod continuing to see play. Its lead has shrunk a little on Doomsday over the years, as that deck has become so prominent, but it will be interesting to see whether or not things stay this way going forward. So those are the top 10 cards from Weatherlight. If you want to own any of them, check out the description, where you can find a direct Card Kingdom link for each card that appeared in the video. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on past videos, including the other ones that look at Mirage Block sets, you should see the playlists on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.